But okay, so a bit higher then. So I was in the European Skeptics Congress in 2010, and um, that started a chain of events <laughs> that uh, led me here. So I want to um, tell you what I did about that, and basically, uh, though I didn't specifically mean it, it was about vaccination. Uh, I just fell into that, basically. Um, so there's a measles epidemic in Europe now. Uh, there's almost 9,300 cases in Romania. I just checked that last night. We have a weekly report. And that's the breakdown on uh, the unvaccinated versus vaccinated um, cases. If you look at that, it's very, um, it's not up to 100% because there's some people which are missing the vaccination status. But otherwise, the data is basically, this is how efficient vaccines are. It's, it's perfect explanation of that. Uh, or, no, if you don't use them, un not efficient. <laughs> Uh, so I want to start with describing, defining an anti-vaccine activist. And it's not a parent that is concerned or wants to understand more about vaccines. That is not an anti-vaccine activist. It's not a parent that expresses doubt or fear at vaccinating. It's not that either. It's not a person that opposes vaccines due to personal belief. And, you know, we can all oppose things because of personal belief. It's not, you're not becoming an activist because of that. And it's also not a person who does not want to vaccinate himself. It's not that. Um, over the last four years, what I've seen is that the anti-vaccine activist is a person who's willing to spread misinformation about vaccination. And these four, guy, four types of people, with a lot of work, can be educated. This guy cannot. OK. I'm not sure where to speak into. Maybe close this out. Um, okay, maybe that's better. Okay, so I want to explain a bit of the background of our epidemic and you know how that impacts uh, everyone. Still better? Okay, yeah, that's right. I'll do that. Okay, so over time, in the last 50 years, um, Romania has not. No, no, it's okay. Romania has basically never opposed vaccination. It was done by everyone. Uh, mostly because the vaccines were made locally by the Cantacuzino Institute, and that was trusted enough to, you know, by the population to not have a debate about it. Uh, however, in the 90s, uh, the vaccines made in the country became low quality because the standards everywhere else uh, <laughs> developed. And in 2010, the uh, Cantacuzino Institute loses GMP. The GMP is the good manufacturing practice. It's basically the, the license to... I mean, basically, it's the way that manufacturers are sure they're making a good product, according to standards. And in 2012, they lost all licenses and vaccines could no longer be produced, which means they needed to be imported. Between those times, there was a vac uh, HPV campaign, and that is important because this campaign um, influenced regulator action for the next eight to nine years. Uh, parents were asked to sign a document if they refuse HPV vaccination. And you know, I think you know that HPV vaccination was a bit controversial when it launched, mostly because it involved um, school-age children, it involved girls specifically, it involved this debate about a sexually transmitted infection. So it was, um, there was anyway that debate. And then because Romania had never asked parents to sign a document in school to vaccinate their kids. The nurse would just come in and say, oh yeah, everyone come here and be vaccinated. That was the practice. So this was the first time the parents needed to sign a document and they needed to sign refusal of the document. You know, the, the, let's say the approach was we would, you know, implicit approval was expected. However, uh, needing to sign a refusal would raise doubts. So at this point, the anti-vaccine movement comes up with conspiracies from all the deaths of the internet and all the deaths of wherever they were hidden. They came up with all the matter of conspiracies. They came into the press. The press started reporting the controversy. Uh, they had stories of girls who died after HPV vaccination. This was somewhere worldwide, which was not actually related. Um, and we had even religious figures opposing vaccines. So the press helps the controversy. And then because even the campaign to doctors was in, insufficiently, um, insufficiently informative, some of them refused to actually vaccinate the kids. So this failure of 
of the campaign still impacts the decision. Actually, in, in 2010, we discussed this, and uh, uh, the actual efficiency of the campaign was 5%. 5% of parents actually vaccinated their kids. Total failure. Okay, um, moving a bit forward, in 2010, the BCG vaccine, which was made by the Cantacuzino Institute, uh, is replaced by the Danish one, which had a problem in 2012 with vaccination, with concentration. And there were uh, severe reactions in the, in the population, some hospitalizations, some surgery, some treatment. Nobody died, but it was you know, a cluster of issues that, that raised a bit of a, uh, lowering the doubt in, in vaccines further. Uh, the, a book came up, uh, an anti-vaccine book, which is, was very, uh, very powerful because there are actually no pro-vaccine books in the country, no, no public-focused pro-vaccine books. So an anti-vaccine book came up, and that was available for free on the internet uh, and you know, cheaply on, on, in libraries, and uh, it started to, to coagulate an anti-vaccine movement. And uh, during all that, the Ministry of Health still remained incapable of actually communicating about vaccination. It was frozen in not being able to communicate. So that was, that was difficult. Um, I want to cover a bit the anti-vaccine tactics, and I'm sure you'll be familiar. Uh, if there's a conversation about child health, they're going to ask, is your child vaccinated? Every time there's a discussion about health and children, they're going to ask if the vaccine was done. Um, they're going to use authority figures to promote natural health. And a lot of anti-vaccine activists are promoters of um, health living or uh, parenting gurus, things like that. There's a lot of uh, that sort of uh, approach. There's, they're clustering in, into, into the natural fallacy. And, of course, they promote the ideas that killer childhood diseases are easy to go through because we all know how many survive polio. Um, or diphtheria, or tetanus, or I can actually list all the <laughs> diseases here. Um, and of course, they have a lot of act actions on virtual and uh, social media, creating a lot of Facebook pages, a lot of groups. I have one group. I'll, I'll get into that soon. I have one group. They have, I think, 20. Not very active, but they are there, right? They're created, and the pages, I think, like 10 Facebook pages only in Romania against vaccination. And they manufacture fake news, constantly recirculate all information. This is the tropes that we need to fight every day, um, simply fighting against the news that was news 10 years ago. It's still coming up. Okay, um, as an example, in 2016, uh, we had a group of kids who came down with hemolytic uremic syndrome. This is an infection from uh, E. coli. Because it was very initial stages, everyone was, was, was speculating about the cause, and the only identified link was the cheese factory. The reason cheese factory was identified is because, beyond the kids in Romania, a child in Italy that ate the products from the same factory came down with the same, the same uh, problem. So they kind of connected evidence-wise. Um, but anti-vaxxers made sure that was it the vaccine theory got in the press? So basically, they started asking parents, the parents of the kids who were in the hospital, have you vaccinated? That is all, not have you vaccinated two days before the issue, have you vaccinated three months or two years before the issue, just have you vaccinated? And once the parents actually said they did, because they did, the ages were, were a few months to a few years old, the kids that got infected. Um, so they asked that and it got into a bit of, of the press and then they even published opinions from the renowned HIV denier and conspiracy theorist Stefan Lanka, I'm sure the German guys know him. Uh, they actually paid for an article to uh, be published in a Romanian uh, paper who allows paid articles. And then, and worst of all actually, um, a government control group investigated the, how the people, how the kids were treated, how, you know, trying to find out the cause, if everyone did their job properly. And they mentioned, during the report, they mentioned um, information about vaccines and how the vaccines were handled by the doctors of the children. And they found some minor issues, but not with the vaccines, just with the handling. And that got spinned into, it was the vaccines all, all along. Still a very strong idea, and, uh, currently. 
Okay, so here's the epidemic. Uh, these are numbers, the top five countries, I believe, but you'll see the, the circles there show the impact. Uh, Italy actually took, took action and there's an, um, a law about vaccination making it very hard to refuse. France is going to take um, action in 2018 and Romania has taken action this month. <laughs> Uh, which is a good thing. Uh, the, the law we have is actually in Parliament being debated now. So the epidemic was officially declared in Romania in September 2016. Uh, in October 2016, the first well-made, good-looking campaign after eight years of silence was m made by the uh, Ministry of Health. We also had a website. I uh, helped in a bit into that. Um, and then the age, age to to vaccinate for MMR was dropped from 12 months to nine months. That is essential in an epidemic. And in less than two months, however, <laughs> the stockpile that the country had was exhausted because you know you, you start with a new group of people, another 100,000 people, you're gonna go through the stockpile very fast. So we exhausted the stockpile, did not have a back order on new vaccines. So in the middle of, a, of a, the epidemic, children were getting sick Parents wanted to vaccinate, um, children were dying even, and there weren't enough vaccines. It was horrible uh, to get that on track, but it took a, it, it took a bit to get, uh, to get back on track and, and fix it. But by May 2017, 25 people had died from, from infection. And this was a, I, I remember that the months, the weeks we were hearing about new and new deaths, usually children. So these are all um, minors except two which were uh, adults, um, and minors is very wide, it's 18 years old, but they were all, all, most of them under one year old. So these weeks in May, when all these numbers came up, it was every week, one or two deaths, it was, it was um, gut-wrenching. So what did the anti-vaxxers do, and what, how did they <laughs> react to the epidemic? Well, first off, they denied the epidemic, because who wouldn't, right? It's just 9,000 cases now. Uh, and then they said nobody died from measles, they had other problems. Which, I'll be honest, is not entirely untrue. However, the, the local CDC equivalent published the, um, um, the cases of deaths and any, out, any diseases that children had before. I looked at that, I went and found out the life expectancy and excluding um, maybe one person who would have died at 30, everyone else would have lived happily until, until pension age. They died from measles. Their complications were, I mean, measles came in into their complications and didn't help in any way, but if they would have not had measles, they would have lived a long life. Of course, um, this is also conspiracy time, so there's an epidemic to, uh, there is an epidemic, you know, strategy one failed, uh, but it's a conspiracy to promote a vaccination law, which is true, a vaccination law is in the works because the, fact the epidemic came in. It was discussed, to be fair, it was discussed previously because the um, coverage rates were dropping, so it was, um, you know, debated by the ministers, but it wasn't actually, you know, pushed into, into legislation. Uh, then they made protests, and this is uh, the hard thing to say. Um, they protested vaccines in the middle of an epidemic. They, they gathered around, not, not, not big crowds, right? Italy had bigger crowds, so. Um, uh, not big crowds, but there were you know, maybe 20, 50 people with banners saying, you know, I don't want to vaccinate. In the middle of an epidemic, again. And some of them actually got on TV and lied through their teeth, and I'm not going to be... Um, generous here about anything related to vaccines there were a few of them i mean the press is of course you know there's quality press which is sometimes not very good quality press and then it's everyone else um, who actually invited these people on and they they you know went back and forth i was actually on a on a talk show with someone about the law and we were supposed to talk about the law and me and another doctor who were with me in the studio actually had to explain vaccines to the guy who was anti-vaccine, but we needed to explain you know, why vaccines are necessary and all the basics of, 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 um, of how to, why, why we have vaccines uh, to a guy who was supposed to be there to debate the law, which was a reasonable discussion to have back and forth with a pro and a con, 
But no, we, we just wasted all the time to debate vaccines themselves. Okay, so what did the government do? Uh, was very slow to react. Um, the, uh, the cases, the clusters started coming in in, in February. The epidemic was announced in September. Um, not a lot of, uh, you know, the age, I mean, there were some actions locally, but it weren't good enough to stop the spread. Then we had elections, which is always a good thing to have in the middle of an epi epidemic. Uh, so, you know, the new minister needed to get up to speed, figure out what he needs to do, um, talk to all the people again before we talk to someone else. Um, we fixed the stockpiles. I don't know if I'm being generous by April, but I think it was April. And because now the ministry is starting to actually react uh, in April 20, uh, that's actually 2017, April 2017. Um, so the ministry started pushing the family doctors to, to, tar to start vaccinating more, to reach out to the communities which were previously um, um, under, underserved by medical services. And the doctors started saying, listen, I'm already burdened by a bureaucracy, which is true. And uh, you, I, I can't do even more than that. I have my time here. I have my, uh, my current issues. So um, finally, the legislation law was put into place. Um, it, was, it was being discussed in 2015, but it started being into the public debate in May 2017. And it was actually published after a round of public debate and sent to the government for approval. And it's now pending in parliament. There is a strong majority to, to adopt it. I can explain the details of it, but it's uh, one of the best laws uh, about making sure that everyone vaccinates and making sure that not vaccinating is not easy, because that is important, to not make it easy. Okay, so what do the skeptics do? I'll, I don't want to brag here, but I will. Um, so I, uh, a group was, was started a long time ago, and that group uh, had eventually reached 10,000 users, and now it has reached 54,000 users. And that is actually the biggest pro-vaccine group on Facebook, not on Roma in Romania, in, on Facebook. Um, this is the growth, the stats, so you, know, you don't have to believe it, I can show you. Uh, that is the, uh, there is the time that the epidemic was announced, right there. And that is the, basically the number of posts and the number of members, all that grew significantly. It's, it's activity, but it's, you know, you can see the, uh, I, think, I think the members, no, they're not here, but it, that's the activity type. Okay, um, I started a page called Healthy Romania Coalition um, in February 2016, and it grew to 16,000 likes in one year. Uh, basically, this was, this was uh, what it was doing, it was creating infographics about vaccination, not only about vaccination, but about vaccinations uh, a lot, and trying to answer the questions parents had in an image form, simple to understand, uh, which, which actually grew it very, very well. Um, the press, after, you know, after being a bit on the pro and con uh, page, started actually going against va uh, anti-vaxxers as more and more deaths came up and started ignoring them and their rights. Um, and um, bloggers started coming in, you know, people who would not normally discuss vaccination they started saying, listen, why are we even debating this? Um, so big influences on that started came, coming in and, and you know, helping to shape the public, public view. Um, I was involved and, and groups were involved in shaping the law. I'm very happy to say that something I actually proposed was, is in the law. <laughs> so hopefully it gets through to everything, but I'm, I'm going to be happy about, about that amendment. And um, the groups, the group I mentioned, which has doctors in it, by the way, so it's not just me uh, with my skeptical uh, uh, view. Uh, there's the doctors in it who reply. So we've provided constant support to parents, encouraging them to vaccinate, encouraging them to go to the doctor earlier for the nine months uh, vaccine if, if they had a child that young. So that was very, very important. Okay, so see, the title was a bit misleading. I gave you all the history. <laughs> Uh, and now there's this. So the Romanian anti-vaccine movement has extensive connections to European anti-vaccine organizations. And making a, a, a bit of a joke on Andras here, they're more organized than the ESCO. <laughs> they are, really. Uh, 
I, I don't want to criticize it, just the thing. Uh, more visible, right? Um, they were, they were in involved in translating and spreading anti-vaccine documentaries. I don't know if you're seeing this every day, but I do. Uh, there's a new documentary uh, about anti how, why you shouldn't vaccinate coming out every few months or so. So, they, sometimes they, they do the uh, translation and they do the subtitles on that and it gets spread out on YouTube for, uh, you know, forever, basically. Um, and Romanians being a very migratory population, I'm sure you know some, um, they have, I mean, anti-vaxxers go into Romanian in, you know, Italy, Germany, UK, Spain, and uh, they promote these ideas, even starting with natural thinking and, and natural treatments, and then moving slowly into, into advising migrant parents how to avoid local legislation. And legislation about vaccination in Europe is um, highly variable. Uh, some countries have some vaccines as mandatory and others are not. Uh, MMR is usually not mandatory anywhere, excepting Italy now. Um, and um, while this may change in time as countries start to, to realize that allowing parents to not vaccinate is a problem, um, it, it takes a lot of time and every country has to do their own, their own piece. Uh, and also, Romanian anti-vaccine movement has experience in exporting measles. Uh, so, Belgium was actually uh, had an epidemic, maybe a small uh, outburst in in, Bel in Wallonia in 2017. And we also exported in 2004 to the U.S. But to be fair, that was the American anti-vaxxers coming into Romania and going back with it. We didn't <laughs> we didn't uh, push that on them. <laughs> No, you can actually find this on the CDC website, that uh, an American came to Romania, church things, helping out, and then went back and 200 people had measles in, in America. <laughs> they could. Um, and of course, because of the law, which is, again, it's quite strict, there is high potential for, for the most extreme anti-vaxxers in Romania to actually migrate to countries with, with less um, legislation about, about that, so be mindful of that. Uh, it was a, it was a, yeah, it was a kid in Romania who went over the summer and came back to Valonia and bam. Uh, okay, so what to do? And I want to, you know, mirror what Andra said. I think we can do a lot. Uh, my work for the last four years have, has been in being involved with doctors. Doctors have, um, you know, in Romania there's a group about vaccination specialists and uh, they, they, um, they help me in the group. I help them with creating the images I discussed on the, on the page, and helping out. You know, they they the whole group, the the, the Facebook group, is has a lot of questions. This, they're repeating questions. The doctors will not answer that, but they will answer once, and then the moderators, my team of moderators, will um, repeat that answer when it when it fits. Um, but we can engage with authorities, and actually, the response to that from authorities. And from the people who I went with and uh, went to and said, "Listen, I'm, I'm trying to help. I'm doing this already. Do you need more help?" And they were excited about me. <laughs> they were like, "Oh, that's very good. Thank you. This is, I mean, you know, come to a meeting. Let's discuss more about what you can do." And uh, this is what I mean. You can su supplement and support medical professional organizations. I, I can tell you this: doctors in your country do not know enough about vaccination. Unless they're, you know, constantly being teached, uh, taught about vaccination, they do not know how to answer all the anti-vaxxer questions. Okay, maybe they can answer the general parenting questions: Is this safe? Is what sort of reaction will it will there be? That is okay, but the more detailed ones, they don't know how to answer. Oh, <laughs> that's a lot of examples. Um, and then you can, we, we can come with new approaches and new types of actions. In, in Romania, most of the doctors are, um, the family doctors, the family physicians, which are the primary vaccinators. They're, let's say, over 50. Um, and their experience in going into social media, their comfort, personal comfort in going to social media is lower. Um, and, and they don't engage as much as they should. Younger doctors do that, but there's not enough of them. And so we can come in and say, listen, I have this doctor, I, I have this doctor on call, right? He can answer my questions. 
and you can go and create your own group, start a discussion, create uh, the, the influence. Um, and the point is, this will be appreciated, and I'll show you how it was appreciated in Romania. Yeah, this is the WHO um, thanking me, there you go, for supporting them during European Immunization Week. That, I mean, I didn't ask for that. <laughs> I didn't. And this is a, um, a patient coalition in Romania who started a, camp, um, a um, voting system for the best, this, is the, this means the best uh, information campaign in health. And I got the public's prize. This means they voted online and I got the most votes uh, because I have 16,000 likes, so, you know. <laughs> They're gonna come in. The, <clears throat> and, and the other 50,000 people in the group. So they, they, they came through in supporting, and this, this is not money. This is, I mean, there's some, some pharma support here, but it didn't mean any money. I got a tree, <laughs> uh, you know, a tree, a bonsai. Um, so just to end, I, I was wondering, I was for, trying to figure out how to end it. I think we are all public health advocates in a way. Some, t some, of, the, some of us for the public health of this course public health, health of how to make arguments, correct arguments, public health of uh, um, debates, public health of um, the, you know, the role of religion or anything else in, the, in, in our life. And, but actually vaccines are the public health base. They are the, I think they're the, the base, the core realization of science in a way. And if we lose that, if we lose all this progress we've made with vaccines uh, because we're not engaged enough and we're not pushing enough into, into supporting it, and it will get attacked for, you know, for the length of our lives, it will get attacked by some people. Um, if we don't support it enough, we're going to see epidemics come up again, we're going to see children suffer, and we're going to see you know, st people standing around and asking, what can we do? This is what we can do, we can act on it, we can um, make sure that the anti-vaccine discourse does not reach uh, good enough levels to influence people. And actually the best way to, to handle that is through regulation and you can influence regulation. I can tell you, you can influence regulation. I mean, don't need to push, but you can. You, you can be there and you can, you can put your ideas into practice, into regulation. The, you know, the, the strongness of regulation, how strong that regulation is, is a country thing. Maybe there'll be a debate at a European level at one point, but you can influence that. Okay, thank you. <laughs>